Um, I chose to talk about vital infrastructure because uh, M6 in the Netherlands is part of vital infrastructure or is providing vital services. And uh, since uh, we do a lot of uh, research uh, here, but also, of course, back home into security and how we can protect that, I felt it's uh, probably a good way to uh, to address the topic. <clears throat> As said, I'm the CEO of uh, M6. Next to that, I'm also a co uh, chairman of a foundation called the uh, DENL, which is representing the Dutch digital infrastructure in the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm also a member of the advisory council for an organization called Community Trump. Should have shaved this morning. I'm also um, uh, in the advisory board of an organization called Connected Trust, uh, which is an organization that is working together with the Dutch government to share a threat intel and vulnerability information with uh, enterprises in the Netherlands. So hence my link also to the security uh, uh, side of the spectrum. Uh, and before I joined OM6, I spent a lot of time in transformation, digital transformation predominantly, but also in the security market, more, mostly on the sales side. So selling security solutions to, uh, to enterprises and other types of organizations. So how do we secure or should we secure or is it a private or a public matter? But first, a little bit of history, um, because I think uh, it's, in, it's, it's important to understand that if we look at where we are today, uh, there are some reasons why we are where we are, I believe. So first of all, two numbers. We are in Germany, so maybe some of you know, but do any of you have any clue what these numbers represent? You do the math? Right, there's 33 uh, in the middle, but it's actually two very important locations. One you probably know well, fall of the, the Berlin Wall, 1989. And then 2022, last year, Russia um, attacking Ukraine. So back in 1989, when I was still a handsome young man, we were very, very optimistic about what was happening to the world. Uh, it was the, also the beginning of the internet, but also uh, you know, no more war. Are we really going to unite Europe? A real positive vibe. And only 30 years later, here we are again with a lot of challenges, not just in terms of, of uh, uh, war. Eh? There's also now something happening in Israel, but also in terms of where we are with the internet and technology. Really, it really went a very long way trying to do this. It's better less uh, rumble. So 89 to, to 2022. Similarly, when we go back to 89, there was hardly any automation. There was some computer science, and this is uh, a picture of a computer back in the Netherlands, um, and it was uh, doing some, um, some work on payroll, right? It was a room full of equipment, which I think if you would do that today, it's probably one server in a rack somewhere in, in a data center. Today, this is where we are. Everything is connected. The internet is practically everywhere. Right? How many of you have a smartphone? All of us, right? We're constantly connected all the time. So we really have taken it from down in the basement with a lot of big hardware and, uh, and machines to being connected. And actually, your phone is more powerful than the machine you saw on the picture just now. We're also seeing a new world order. Again, back to 89, we were really hopeful, world peace and all these things. Today we see the discussions around China, but we also see India becoming one of the largest economies in the world, maybe 1.4 billion people. So very different uh, dynamics, uh, BRIC countries and really, um, oh, there's India, sorry. Um, um, different uh, uh, different ways of, of looking at the world and, and world order. Saudi Arabia. Um, Today, very much depending on oil, but really trying to transform themselves into a country that also is big in things like uh, AI, but also cyber, of course, but also um, uh, going there on holiday. I can't think of the word tourism. Sorry, that was the word I was uh, looking for. And this is a project called uh, the Stripe, and it's going to be, uh, uh, if it goes through, it's a, it's a city in the shape of a stripe, and it's going to be hundreds of kilometers long. Uh, just through the desert of Saudi Arabia. So it's not only technologically uh, a miracle, but you could also wonder, is it actually good to do this? So what about uh, nature? What about the climate and all these things? But it is happening and they're really serious about building it. Again, back in uh, 1989, we didn't have the internet practically. 
So today when I talk to my kids, although they're slightly older now, yeah, we have this old daddy uh, thing. Well, we didn't have Google when I uh, was in high school. And they said, well, but, but how, how did you then go onto the internet? Well, there was no internet. So how did you learn? How, how did you how did you communicate with your friends? How did you? Uh, it's a whole different concept these days. And all of that happened in, in those same 30 years. So there's a lot of big tech companies and they're growing fast. <clears throat> Actually, um, in general, when we look uh, space there's a lot of pressure there's a lot of consolidation but both uh, meta and uh, microsoft uh, publish their quarterly results everything up to the top right so they're doing actually really well compared to some of the others so these companies are still growing netflix with the new subscription model they still managed to get more than 8 million new subscribers last quarter so they are still growing and they're doing a lot of uh, uh, good stuff mm. the other thing with with tech companies is that Deliberately or not, when we look at uh, at uh, the OC model, you probably notice right of the different layers of how communication is stacked. On every level, these companies now have an influence. So, for example, as M6, we are uh, we used to be standardized on extreme switching equipment, but because of the demands these companies put on companies like Extreme, they stopped developing a certain product, and that was our core product. So we had to switch to a different vendor simply because Extreme chose to only build what they call the pizza box type equipment. Because if they do, and Facebook or, or Netflix orders, they order 10, 20, 30, maybe 100,000 of these units. Whereas if we order, we order maybe five. So deliberately or not, you see that even manufacturers are starting to shift their technology development geared towards these, uh, these uh, hyperscale type companies. Climate change, can't get away from it, right? There's, uh, it's real, it's happening. And um, on the one hand, you could argue that that uh, internet or AI and new technology can really help solve some of these problems. Having these big language models are really the, the ability to do large scale processing. It could help. But when we look at the power consumption of the latest GPU, and NVIDIA is the, the absolute market leader in, uh, in uh, GPUs, the technology under AI, uh, if they are uh, going full throttle, they're using as much as a rack full of switching or regular server equipment in a data center, just one unit. So you can imagine if you, you know, fill up the whole rack with these GPUs and you're going to do powerful AI, it's going to even be more uh, consumption. So if we're not careful, we're actually becoming part of the problem. We're using so much power that we're uh, using more than we're actually trying to solve with some of these uh, calculations. So climate change in general is real, but also as an industry, we really need to start to think about these things. So in the Netherlands, uh, I don't know the number for the whole industry, but for the data center industry, for example, the total power consumption of all the data centers in the Netherlands is now roughly about 3%. <clears throat> Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's compared to some of the other industries, it's actually, it's significant. So again, we really need to think about how do we use innovation also on the power side when we think about developing new technologies in our space. That leads to discussions around social responsibility. And again, these pictures are slightly older than 89, but even in the in the 70s and the 1970s, there were uh, different views on uh, how to sort of rule the world. Friedman talked about uh, it's really about shareholder uh, value. So uh, profitability, profitability, profitability. On the one hand, it really led to a lot of uh, uh, development and, uh, and new companies and new technology, but at what cost? And today we are more aware of uh, just making money may not be good for our health or for the environment. Or So there's a new, uh, new sort of thinking happening. But even back in 1972, the Club of Rome, as it's called, already had a manifest that talked about how we should really think about climate. So you could argue we've spent 60 years doing nothing, right? 50 years doing nothing, whereas we already knew almost 50 years ago that this was going to be an issue and we had to do something about it. So we really have to catch up on these topics and that's where IT and the internet can help and that's where vital infrastructures are really important as well. Uh, but therefore, they're also a, a target to uh, which we need to protect. Them. If we then switch to connectivity specifically, and, and a vital infrastructure is more than connectivity, but since uh, I represent uh, M6, uh, 
You could argue that uh, what sets us apart as humans from other species is that we have the ability to tell each other stories. And we have tools to do that as well, more and more. In the old days, maybe books or really storytelling, but more and more, of course, also digital tools that we use to do that. So what if, you know, it's one school of thought, but that's what we believe, uh, or one school of thought of what sets us apart. Very quickly, we started to develop language and, and we started to write stuff down. And this is a very old uh, tablet, of course, but today still we use language and we, and we write a lot of stuff down on our phones, digitally, etc. So language really also developed uh, amongst uh, humans. Not so long ago, we then started to digitize that communication. So it became more like this. And of course, very soon thereafter, we started to communicate like this. Um, this is uh, sea cables, uh, and it's only a part of it. If you would really look at all the sea cables that are currently uh, built or in place around the world, it's, it's incredible the amount of fiber that is being put in the ground and in the sea and all the connectivity that is happening. Um, the newest developments, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of, uh, see if I can get this to work, there's a lot of connectivity here from Northern uh, America to Europe. And you see sort of that end shape, right? The information going up and down into Africa. And there, now there's a lot of investments happening really in the Southern Hemisphere where uh, South America, Africa, and Asia are being interconnected. So some of those traffic flows are going to change. And that's important, again, if we think about vital infrastructure and how we communicate with each other, right? Part of understanding where our traffic goes is to understand how these highways are being constructed globally and who actually owns those cables. Because many of them are uh, by hyperscalers, but also Chinese companies or and back to those geopolitical discussions, do we do we agree to that or should we think of alternatives? And of course, there's satellite. Now, uh, satellite communication is uh, growing. Um, satellite communication is uh, is growing, uh, and technology is really developing uh, fast. Um, and that's great because it's another alternative to be able to communicate. But I think we've all also seen the examples of uh, Elon Musk, right, deciding whether or not. Uh, internet should be available in Ukraine or in Russia. And now a similar discussion is happening actually uh, across uh, uh, Israel and Palestine as well. And on the one hand, it's great that we have these technologies and we can put them where it's needed. On the other hand, do we want Elon Musk to decide whether or not people have access to the internet? Right, so again, if we think about vital infrastructure, and, and I think we all agree internet is becoming part of that vital infrastructure, do we leave that to billionaires? Or do we have other ways to actually decide who has access to and what type of access do you have to vital services like the internet? Final piece, digitalization. Today we uh, we talk in terms of files, right? Who of you has ever held a file? Nobody, right? You can't, you, you, it's, you can't touch it. A document you can or a book or a, Right, but, or a picture, but you can't touch a file, right? It's virtual. So the, the, the final step we're, we're in now in terms of developing communication and, and, and how we interact with each other is that basically our lives become virtual. And there's a great book. I don't know if it's already translated into English or even German, but it's called Real Fake. And it's about uh, a research study that is done in the Netherlands about how we perceive real and fake. Given uh, I'm of a certain age, to me, real is uh, I can touch it and uh, and a picture, right? Uh, really, a, a painted picture to me is more uh, real. But but to my children or to many teenagers, something actually happening in a game or uh, uh, a particular object in a game may be real to them. And one of these examples is that in uh, in one of these uh, sort of metaverse type games, there is a Gucci bag which is more expensive in the game than it is to buy for real in the shop. Because there's only one in the game. And somebody bought it because to him or her, we don't know who it is, it's more real to them than it is to us. Now, is it a fake or is it real? It's real money being spent on it, but it's virtual. They can't touch it. But because it's only them that has that particular bag in the game, it is real 
to them. So files. The benefit of having files is that, of course, we can move it around quickly. In the old days, if we had to set up new connections, we had to, you know, blow up mountains and uh, put tracks uh, in place and all these things to really get from A to B. But in this virtual world, I mean, there's still people joining, right? You can be anywhere, but still be present uh, at a presentation like this or in a meeting or uh, having contact with your family. So also in how we deal with the world and how we look at the world, there is a big shift in also understanding digital. Now, the paradox, of course, is we can only do that if we put physical stuff in the ground or have wires above, right? If we don't have these cables, then we can't communicate. But once they're in, we, we go into this virtual realm and 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 it's it's a it's a difficult place to be sometimes because we don't really fully understand how it all hangs together, right? A train track you can see, the train arrives, you can get in, you can you can get in or not. Uh, all of these things are are very physical, and and we are used to that for thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years. The virtual world is really new, right? So I talked about those two numbers at the beginning, 89, 22, roughly 33 years uh, in between. And that's roughly how old the internet is. About 30 years. It's not that old, right? Especially not for me. I'm quite a bit older, right? But 30 years is not that old. It's a very young industry, but the developments are, are really exponential. So that's why it is really important to start to think about these things, because you could argue in some way, it also has gotten away from us a little bit, right? There are things happening on the internet that you could argue are not so nice. We really need to figure out how to deal with that. And part of that, of course, is crime. Final piece, as that digitalization, like I said, a lot of what we do actually happens in the digital world. And with uh, AI uh, growing more and more, but also with uh, metaverse type applications uh, growing, then more and more this is happening in the virtual world. Like I said, there's people that spend more money on a Gucci bag in a game than in the real time. So there's people that spend a lot of their time there rather than in real life. Doesn't have to be a bad thing, but we do need to be cognizant of the fact that it is a different place than physically, right? Now we're in a room, doors are closed. If somebody wants to get in, they need to make an effort. If it's virtual, I don't know who's joining this team meeting. Of course, I can have a look, but, but I don't know if the, actually the name that is on the screen is the person that sits behind the screen as well. So it's a different attitude, it's a different way of looking at access to information, access to people, and being present in, in situations like this, for example. So it brings us a lot of opportunity and, and can really help us evolve, but there's really a different mentality we need to have to securing uh, that virtual space. So should we be worried? You know, we have all these great technologies and uh, new iPhones and uh, bandwidth growing and all these opportunities and working from home and great, right? Right? This is just a snapshot of a number of incidents that have happened in the last couple of years to companies or to equipment. And the reason why I put this in is that, for example, um, I'll start at the bottom right. It's not uh, the latest one, it's 2022, right? but more than 75 defects were solved in just one update of Microsoft. So it was one patch and it dealt with 75 issues just in that one particular product, which we probably all use. Um, in the US, the, the organization that is looking after vulnerabilities just this year, right? we still have two months to go, they've already investigated more than 28,000 vulnerabilities in equipment, software, tools, et cetera. And that's the ones they know of. And all of that typically leads to incidents like you see here, right? And they can be significant. They can be about trying to poison the city water supply or about really trying to hack oil facilities. So you can no longer get maybe gas at the pump, right? So some of these are really severe. This is... Um, on the right, it's Dutch, unfortunately. It's called the Fokke and Sukke. They are a cartoon in the newspaper and they're always very much on the money. And what they're saying here in Dutch, they're looking at a fire alarm and they're worried about the fact, well, what if the fire alarm is having a shortcut and the room burns down? Right. So this is about, so when we start to think about security, are we actually applying it correctly? Um, and, and as an industry, are we doing the right things to actually secure 
whatever we need to secure. And governments start to believe we're not. Right? So the way governments work is they leave a lot to the market and, and the market tries to solve this. And if the market doesn't and there's a lot of incidents, then governments start to feel, hey, we need to do something about it and they will start to regulate those markets. And you can't blame them because as a civilian, yeah, you, you, wanna, you, want, you want the government to take care of you and protect you. So as an industry, and I'm part of that, we cannot credibly claim we're doing a good job. Right? If we go back to the other slide, if this is the world we live in every day, all day, then we cannot claim we got this, right? It's not. So government's coming with a lot of regulation to help us because what they're seeing is that the market is on fire and as an industry, we're not solving it. The problem is, of course, how do they regulate? What do they bring? Not just to vital infrastructure, but also to you and me as a user. So on the one hand, what we're seeing today is literally a waterfall in new regulation. So we've had the Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, NIS 2 is coming, we have the Cyber Resilience Act, Cyber Security Act, we have uh, an update of uh, GDPR coming, we have, well, it's a waterfall. And the difficulty is, I mean, I'm, I'm in this market and I'm somewhat interested in it, I mean, I'm here giving a lecture on it, so I sort of know, I think I sort of know what we need to do as an organization to, to deal with this. But a lot of this also has to do with personal liability. So as a company director, if I mess this up, I'm personally liable. I could go to jail if I don't take care of this. I'm sure many of my colleague company directors in the Netherlands or here in Germany are clueless because they're a painter or they have a transport company or they're a shop owner. They're not looking at this. But if they mess it up, they can get into real problem because a lot of these actually have a supply chain element to it. I now need to, as M6, we need to audit our suppliers to make sure they do the right thing. So they're giving us a service that is actually secure. So as a vital industry, we are not using crap product. And if we don't do that well, we are at risk. I'm at risk as a company director for being liable. So on one hand, it's good because it's forcing me to do these things. But then again, you know, if, if nobody knows, is it actually good to have the regulation? The, re the reason why I put this one up, there's a, there's a very nice article. I can share the link as well. Apparently, uh, during the Brexit uh, 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 vote, uh, somebody wanted to burn the European flag. I guess pro-Brexit, right? And they couldn't because the damn thing wouldn't glit, it just wouldn't burn. Because of all the standards that have been applied to flags, they just couldn't get the thing to burn. Good thing, you would argue. However, if you look at all the numbers, right, it's not one, but there's like five or six different standards that apply to how should you actually produce a flag, right? Maybe a bit over the top. So that's what I'm trying to signify here. So on the one hand, it's good, right? As an industry, we're not dealing enough with these issues. So there should be regulation, but then if there's too much or we don't adopt it well, then why have regulation at all, right? And that's where we need to find the balance. And that's why I challenge, or that's why my ask is, or my, my thesis is, vital infrastructure, should I take care of that? The government, both, how, how do we do this successfully? So, this is the world we live in. That's why the Dutch government and, and there, there are similar activities, of course, in other European countries has designated M6 as vital infrastructure or part of vital services like gas, like oil, like other type of services. Now, what does that mean? Being a critical or a vital service. This is from the, the website of the the Ministry of Economic Affairs. That's the ministry in the Netherlands that is uh, driving this, that is uh, uh, regulating this. And basically, they say, well, you know, if there's no critical services like drinking water, maybe financial services, uh, gas, oil, then uh, we have a big issue because we have issues with our civilians, with our citizens, and that's not good because as a government, we need to protect our civilians. Hence, we need to make sure these vital services are available and working well. Great. Then we start to apply the Dutch cybersecurity strategy to those vital services. 
And what they're saying is there's four pillars, cyber resilience of government and civil organizations. We need to have secure and innovative digital products and services. We need to be able to counter cyber threats, both by state and criminal organizations. And when we look at the cybersecurity market, you know, we need people to do this. It's not all AI and technology. We really need people that are capable of doing this. So those are the, the four pillars. And then they gave it five priorities. And you can read that quicker than I can read it out. So I'm not going to do that. But there's one that I do want to touch on. I'll do it for the people uh, back home. And that's this one. Legislation to ensure that frameworks are clear and ver verifiable. What does that mean? We've just seen a plethora of regulation coming down the pipe. And then there's also one of these pillars is how do we figure out the, the legislation around this? And that has a lot to do with two things. Oh no, sorry, before I go there, uh, um, a little bit more about vital services. And again, you can read it quicker than I can read it out, but there's two types of vital services. On the left, category A, the most important ones, and then category B are literally the, the secondary ones. And they've done that based on economic impact, physical impact, and social impact, right? It's a number of people dying or in distress or uh, revenues lost. Uh, those are the types of things they apply to the different types of services. When we then look, and this is just a subset of all the vital services, if we then look at how they have actually designated them, then you can see national transport is an A, Gas production is an A, and oil supply is an A, and there's one or two others, but everything else is a B. And most importantly, given it's my uh, my line of work, internet and data services and internet access are a B, so they're less important. So we're vital, but maybe not as much. And it's not because I'm uh, I'm too proud. It's oh, I want to be an A. But actually, I think we agree, right? It doesn't matter which service we touch. It doesn't matter which application, which shop, which even a farmer these days, they cannot do without digital services. So even though if I can't get gas at the pump or if I need to wear a sweater because the heating doesn't work, how does that today compare to maybe not having access to digital services? Um, maybe you remember about two years ago, there was a, a global outage of Facebook for about an hour or two. And um, an important uh, customer of ours, and it was uh, on the eight o'clock news. Apparently, Facebook is eight o'clock news in the Netherlands. But um, there was a, a young lady, and she had her phone in her hand, and she was in a panic. You know, she was being interviewed. I can't reach my mom. I can't reach my mom. Facebook is down. I can't reach my mom. And I'm sitting there. You can't, you've got your phone in your hand. Call her. Oh, Facebook. Is Right, so to some people, Facebook is their means of communication. In some parts of the world, Facebook is the internet. Right, back to the hyperscale slide. Is that a good thing? Right, let's think about that. So you could argue that actually digital services, whether it's just the internet or digital service in general, are maybe more like an A than maybe oil and gas these days. Right, so the fact that we cannot use our car, given the fact we can work from home, maybe. No. So we need to think about these vital services and what is more important than, uh, than some of the others. <clears throat> the benefit of this is that the audit trail or the, the, the government auditing us as an organization is also a little less heavy, which of course is a, is a benefit. But you know, we, should, we should really have this discussion about vital services and, and is it more physical than, than virtual? And the second reason why I'm saying that is that in the Netherlands, we have a new initiative. And that initiative is about uh, bringing uh, public and private companies together and potentially NGOs as well. So the, the energy companies, for example, and, and it's all about national security. And the reason they're doing that is that they want to achieve two things. First of all, they want to have better cooperation, but also they really literally want to fill, uh, again, there's an old term, a Rolodex. They really want to make sure that as a CEO, I know who to call at the energy company or maybe at the police or uh, even at the defense department if I have to. So it's also about building this network of people that know each other. So when something big happens, we know how to find each other and do not have to rely only on formal structures. 
So part of it is uh, is about that as well. And the reason they're doing that is because the government starts to realize that digital services are an integral part of almost anything else. During the two days, however, what we found is that all the response that anybody within a government role could think of was physical. So anybody that was responsible for, it's called a security area in the Netherlands, so the municipality and the surrounding area is called a security area. Typically, it's the head of the fire department or the police department that is the head of, of the physical security uh, region. All of their response was physical. So whenever I asked, so what do you do if, uh, you know, the internet goes down or uh, all the bridges open, what do you do? And all of them said, oh, we're going to call the fire department or the police and we're going to send people to it. <laughs> but why would all the bridges open, right? You maybe want to look at the bridge management system and see if there's maybe a hack or something like that. None of them had that concept. So there's a long way to go in trying to defend countries because most of it is actually you know, thought of in physical terms, not so much in digital terms, right? But we just agreed that digital services are critical to practically anything we do nowadays. This. And the other argument I wanted to get to, I just highlighted, right? This law and regulation thing, how do we develop good law around uh, protecting vital infrastructure or I mean, cyber resilience? Okay. And that's privacy. And you know a thing or two about privacy in Germany, right? There's, it's, it's, it's an important piece, and so do we in the Netherlands. We're really proud in protecting privacy, We're really proud in being a country where for a long time we were a safe harbor and we really, really take care of privacy and people. Now, how does that relate to cybercrime? Two examples. Top one, 20 million messages were intercepted, were hacked, collected. Over 60,000 users. The other one, the Dutch municipality of Buren, uh, 130 gigabyte of files were uh, published of the five terabyte that they captured. Which one was uh, worse than the other, you think? I'll help you. What they have in common is both were hacks, both were. Criminals, no, not criminals, both were hacks. Well, in both cases, a system was hacked and a lot of information of a lot of people was taken, was copied, was used to do something with it. The top one was actually the Dutch police hacking the AngroCat server and having 60,000 people, criminals, exchanging information with each other. That was uh, Chief Gegangen. I'll just uh, try and uh, tap dance over this. Um, so the first one, the top one, was the Dutch police hacking into a server, an, 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 encryption, uh, an encrypted message service that was being used by criminals. The second one being public data of people like you and me in a municipality. And criminals hacked that database and then published it to try and get some ransom money, of course. Now the question, of course, then talking about privacy is, do we mind that these 60,000 criminals were hacked? And do we mind less or more if this is the full municipality of Buren, right? Now, I don't need to make that decision, luckily, but this is the type of thing we have to do with when we talk about privacy, when we talk about fighting cybercrime, right? So the, the commonality is both hacks. The difference is one is we're trying to fight crime. Do we, do we care about privacy? I think we still should, but maybe differently than, and the other one was, oh, people like you and me, our pictures and, and things like that. Right, so it very quickly becomes complex. Already back in 2001, again, 20 years ago, there was the Budapest uh, Accord or the, or the Budapest Agreement, where even then they said, when it's about cyber, we really need to balance uh, the, the ability to actually uh, fight crime, but we need to balance that against privacy. Because if we don't, uh, we, we stand to have a bigger problem than we're actually trying to solve. So already 20 years ago, there was this discussion happening and they identified two different types of offenses. There is an offense and you recognize the CIA term, right? If you're in security, confidentiality, integrity and availability of information. It's the, 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 
the OC way of looking at uh, cyber security. And the other, so we need to protect the data basically. And the other one is we need to think about how our computers or how technology being used to uh, uh, do a crime. I said in English, yeah, how to actually perform a crime. So if you use a, a, a system to hack somebody, then you can actually, uh, that's also an offense, right? It's like using a gun to shoot somebody. So they already thought about that 20 years ago. Then there is a lot of privacy regulation, and you could argue when you when you in, when you read that, actually it's 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 defined quite well. You know, this is privacy. There's law. There's regulation. There's all these uh, articles about it. There's jurisprudence, and uh, so you know a lot of lot of ways to look at privacy. And you could argue it's actually done pretty well. However, when we then really start to look at what is it and what are my rights as an individual, it becomes quite ambivalent very quickly. And not just because of the way the law looks at it, and, and a lot of it is is you know interpreted rather than black and white written down. But then, of course, also it's different here in Germany than it is in the Netherlands, than it is in Belgium, than it is in the US or China or other countries. So privacy is not one thing globally. It's something very different in very different countries and in very different settings. And a lot of it has to do with context, history, and how uh, we look at these things. Again, in the Netherlands and in Germany also, we're, we're very specific about it. And we really protect it and, and do a lot to protect it well. In the US, well, they don't care so much. I travel quite a bit and I'm actually, I'm happy I'm a European citizen. I like GDPR, even though it's a consultant's wet dream. I like it because it really gives us a lot of uh, uh, jurisprudence and a lot of legal ground to deal with privacy. But I also travel to the US quite a bit. You know, you just, I mean, you basically strip naked. This is who I am in front of uh, customs because they don't care, right? There's the the the, uh, the National Security Act and they have every right to, to know everything about you that they want. So how does the German Secret Service then deal with a, a request from the US or the Dutch for that matter? Or So even though we may have dealt with this really well in the Netherlands, if it becomes international, how does that work? And that's where Schrempf, for example, has done a lot of work, a lot of good work in really challenging these laws that the European Union is trying to agree with the US. How do we share you, your and my data when it comes about these things? And all these things are important when we think about vital infrastructure, because, you know, like DKX, also in the Netherlands, we have about 11, 12 terabit of traffic going over our platform every second. That's like 4 million HD videos with a whole Shakespearean collection, I think uh, a million times over, huge amount of data, right? So if somebody wants to get on, get on that, uh, how do we make that proportional? Or how do we protect the privacy or how do we? So it's huge amounts of data and it's all international. 70% of our customers are not even from the Netherlands. So they may have very different rules about privacy than we do. So being vital services, part of vital services in the Netherlands, means something we have to do according to Dutch law. But again, some of our customers may have a very different view. So it's not that simple. It's not that easy. When you say, oh, there's a lot of law about privacy, done. It's very complex and there's a lot of shades of, of gray. Then when we look at how do we investigate crime or how can we protect that, then there's basically four, common four uh, ways of doing that. You can look at public data, Facebook and all these things. You can uh, data protection orders, right? So they can actually go to a service provider and put a tap. Uh, they can, of course, use uh, online undercover methods or they can actually hack. And if I understand correctly, the Dutch authorities are allowed to do that legally. Of course, they have to have a permit, but they can. And I believe in Germany, you cannot. I'm not entirely sure, right? But it differs again per country. So in the Netherlands, they can be offensive if they want to. So like hacking that EncroChat server, remember a couple of slides back? The Dutch police is allowed to do that in the Netherlands. And some other countries, of course, allow that too. <clears throat> a couple of obstacles. Jurisdiction, like I said, they can do it in the Netherlands, but not somewhere else. What if the criminal just uh, moves a couple of kilometers and sits in Germany or in Belgium? Do they still have the ability to do that? And then there's the location of the crime and the perpetrator. So you may be hacked and, and be ransomware, but it may be somebody in China or somewhere else that is actually doing it. So how do we actually get to the guy or the girl? that is doing it to us while we're in a different place. 
anonymity. So even though IP addresses give us a lot of information, it doesn't say anything about the person necessarily sitting behind it. And then of course there's encryption. I'm a big fan of keeping encryption alive, right? Because it's one of the few means we have to really be able to communicate in private. Think of journalists and activists, etc. But there's a lot of pressure on it also in Europe to try and, and create back doors for governments so they can actually get in. So as I'm six, we are really uh, defending this. Eh? We're uh, talking to the Dutch government, but also European uh, governments to really make sure we keep encryption so all of us can still communicate uh, in, in private. But of course, criminals use it as well. So we need to think of other ways to fight criminality and not by hacking, uh, sorry, breaking, uh, breaking encryption. So you could argue that digital infrastructure, vital or not, is a benefit to us. It gives us a lot of opportunities, but it's also a benefit to the criminal because they can use the same things we like so much against us as well in, in uh, being bad. Final piece, are we forgetting something? Now this is, uh, you'll recognize the Netherlands here. This is um, uh, a projection of what's gonna happen on the North Sea until 2050. Is there, uh, no, this is, uh, this is 2050, oh yeah, 2050 and today. And uh, it's a bit hard to see, but uh, you know, there's the 12 mile area that is all uh, Dutch territory. And, and we have jurisdiction as, as uh, the Dutch uh, government, like Germany has in the German economic zone. Then there is another couple of miles that is sort of gray area, but you know, we can protect that. And then Europe, Europe said all of this is for you to develop as an economic zone, the Netherlands. And actually, when, when you look at that picture, uh, it is roughly the same size, slightly bigger even than the landmass we have. So again, from vital services, we are looking mainly at this, the sea cables and uh, data centers and, uh, and all these things. And then, oh darn, <laughs> there's actually twice the size that we call the economic zone in Europe that we have to defend. And of course, the same is true for Belgium and France and, and Germany up north, et cetera. Right, and all these these colors you see are windmills, oil rigs, gas, fiber cables, all the things we use and take for granted. And there's no law, there's no jurisdiction outside that 12 mile zone. There's a little bit of law around piracy. You may you may defend yourself against piracy, but there's no law, no regulation globally around how to protect yourself when you're outside of the 12 mile zone. Great, right? So the Netherlands is really, really uh, invent, uh, investing a lot in windmills and all these things on the North Sea. So is the UK and all these other countries. We will be depending on this for our energy in the coming years. But it's, uh, it's Wild West, right? So we had this incident where a Russian ship took a total of, I think, 62 turns to actually cross a particular cable and a gas pipe. And of course, they were doing reconnaissance. There was nothing anybody could do against it. And it could have been any ship, it happened to be a Russian ship. We, there's nothing anybody could do because they were in international waters, no law, no regulation. And if they would have attacked, there was a Dutch marine ship next to it. If they would have attacked or defended, oh, it's an act of war. That we do take, did take care of, but not how to defend all of this. So again, we're putting huge investments into vital infrastructure into the North Sea and there's no law or regulation on how to protect it. So we have a lot of work to do. And a lot of this is not just for the Netherlands, the Netherlands being a small country, but a European hub, a lot of this energy and data and all these things is also coming into Germany and to France and Belgium, et cetera, right? So it's, it's really a European challenge, not just a Dutch challenge. So my view is, and, and I'm not alone in this, of course, is that we should really work together. And PPS is Dutch for public private samenwerking, cooperation. And, um, and, and, and we're doing it and we have to do more of it. Because I gave you all these challenges and, and this insight to show you that I, I can't solve that. I don't own any of these fiber cables, right? The data center does, owns the data center, but doesn't own any of the energy connections coming into the country. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we have to work out how to do this together, and even governments do not have the full jurisdiction to protect some of this vital infrastructure. So we do need to figure out how to do this together. 
We also do need to figure out how to do this together because I cannot, um, if I'm being attacked, I cannot easily contact the German police, for example, say, hey, I need your help. There's somebody in Germany doing this to me. I need to go to the Dutch police and then be able. So governments need to agree how they are going to deal with these issues if there are international uh, uh, incidents, right, and how to, to deal with this. And then finally, of course, if there's really big events, like I said, if all the bridges in the Netherlands would open, it may be through me. Yeah, the attack may come through M6 if it's a virtual attack, but somebody needs to drive to the bridge and start to you know, look at traffic and all these things. So that's why in the response, it is also really necessary to have uh, the government involved as well. <clears throat> Sorry, I had a terrible cold last week. Uh, I've almost managed the hour. So we need to work together. <clears throat> and the current way of doing that is that there is already a lot of sharing of information. The difficulty is, this is the schedule how to do it. And I took the Dutch version. I have a similar version of the German way, right? So who do I call, right? If something happens, let's look at the schedule. So we really need to figure out how we're going to do this more effectively. The good thing is we're thinking about it and we're trying to put it together. <laughs> Again, this is an example of how we share all this threat intel. And um, and attacks when they're uh, when they're going. The problem is we really need to think about this in a more effective way because there's more and more zero days <clears throat> vulnerabilities, right? Where you do not have the time to respond and really build a remedy, so they're being exploited literally at the same day. So that's why in the in the marketing literature you see a lot about zero trust. Basically, it's no it's not a question when. Sorry, it's not a question if you will be hacked. It's just a matter of when you will be hacked because you will be hacked. So you really also need to start to think about your response, right, when that happens. In the Netherlands for a while, they had uh, the Dutch government had the idea, you know what, we're going to regulate this thing. Uh, all vital infrastructure, you have to send us uh, twice a year. You have to send a snapshot of all your assets, send it to us. We'll then uh, apply some AI or something and figure out what all the vulnerabilities are and tell you whether or not you're vulnerable. And we're like, maybe not, because A, I don't even know all my assets. <laughs> I wish I, I, I could, right? but in many cases, it's very difficult to understand all the assets you have. Two, what a great idea to create one database somewhere in the Netherlands that has all the assets of all the vital infrastructure in the Netherlands. Right? You don't want that. And then the other thing is the arrogance of the government being able to decide whether or not I'm vulnerable. <laughs> so we have to have a so-called pool model whereby we do push information into sharing, but we pull the information that we need depending on the solutions we use, the equipment we have, or the threat we're facing, like a sore throat. Sorry for that. I already talked about the international jurisdiction. Final piece, the internet is currently uh, governed by organizations that are non-profit and independent. So there's the Internet uh, Society, ISOC, ICANN, and other types of organizations. RIPE, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, in Europe, <coughs> managing the IP space. There are some proposals to try and put the governance of the internet under the ITU. Again, we're against that, because if you do, it becomes part of the United Nations, and per default, then the government governance of the internet will become political. Right, and we'll see things like what we call the splinter net. Countries will separate and they will no longer adhere to the same standards and they will build their own internet for obvious reasons. So that's where we say we should really not make it political. But we do need to deal with these fires and all these things, right? We, we talked about in the beginning. So that's why we need to work together to harden the resilience and everything else, but not make it purely political. Skip this. 
So finally, what I think we should do, or what we think we should do, is uh, is partially based on the on that cyber security strategy you saw earlier. But there's basically four pillars that we need to look at. One is we really need to continue to build our resilience. So both the government, but also organization like ours, any organization really needs to become more adept about cybersecurity. It's like driving a car, right? We all learned how to do that, and there's rules and regulations and all these things you have to adhere to. Similar things we need to do for uh, for cyber. And uh, we also need to take care of things like jurisdiction and privacy. We really need. It's complex, but we we really need to think of those things. So that's why we need uh, the governments. Need to think about this internationally. When we look at products and services, there's a lot of regulation now coming that actually forces companies to make safe products, like uh, the German car industry is making safe cars, airbags, uh, seat belts, uh, all these things, and more and more electronics in, in how to be safe on the road. Similar things need to happen in, uh, in cyber. We really need to start to think about how we manage these, uh, these threats, so things need to become visible, transparent, so we can develop adequate response as well. And it's a, it's a hard uh, call, but still, uh, nation states also need to respect international law. And there is a school of thought that actually says, well, maybe we are at war already, but then in cyber. So no bullets are flying, right? But if you look at some of the threats that we're seeing or the activity we're seeing in terms of DDoS or other reconnaissance that is happening, you could argue in cyber, there is a lot of uh, elbow rubbing already going on between nation states. Uh, I don't know what uh, this is from the <laughs> presentation, I think. And then we need to think about the security market. So we can only do this if we have enough people that you know are interested in security, willing to invest time, effort, and, and train in it. Because as much as the technology will help and AI will help and all these things, in the end, uh, it's it's still a human uh, human business. So protecting uh, vital infrastructure is really something we have to do collectively between public and private. It's not one or the other. We really have to work together to make this happen, even internationally, organizations amongst themselves. So we work together with DKIX to come up with standards to be more secure, but we also need to do this on the, on the government level. And then finally, of course, we also need to think about AI and quantum. And I'm saying that because uh, uh, what happened with social uh, media, right? You could argue uh, we cannot let that happen again. So the influence social media has today, right, is is uh, is not good. You could argue. So we didn't talk about that. I didn't want to go into that rabbit hole. But for example, is fake news a crime or not? If you're really trying to influence elections, is that a crime or not? Right? It's been like that forever. Whether it's newspapers or billboards but fake news is becoming so difficult to uh, recognize that you could argue we really need to start to think about this as well and that's where ai comes in it can recognize it but of course also produce it <clears throat> and just this morning i read an article about quantum quantum computing will be a while but also as i'm saying we're working on quantum key distribution and you can use quantum keys to actually encrypt data and when you do it becomes uh, difficult to break or basically impossible to break, even with a quantum computer. So that's why we also really need to start to think about quantum, because if we don't, then uh, we stand to lose again a lot of information because the encryption can be broken uh, over time. So what we're seeing is that some nation states are really collecting a lot of data. They're just collecting it, even though it's encrypted, and they're waiting for quantum computing to come, so then they can go back and decrypt it. Things like that. So that's why we also really need to start to think about these new technologies and get ahead and not like with social media, 30 years later go, oh darn, we should have thought of that. Right? So let's get ahead. And again, that's where we need government because it's about law, regulation, technology, working together. And sometimes you know, we can do this on quantum because we have some funding from a growth fund, as it's called in the Netherlands. If there's nothing happening in the market, then, then the Dutch government is funding some of these initiatives. We'll probably have the same thing here in Germany. And, uh, and that's uh, where we can actually spend some time and effort on it in making that happen. So protecting uh, vital infrastructure is a matter of public and private cooperation. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll fail. Thank you.